So let's go ahead and get started. Um, super excited to have you all here today for introduction to building with LLMs in Xeno. My name is Liz. I'm the developer community manager. Um, we have Michael joining us, Chris as well. We will be in the chat. Uh, so Michael, I will pass it over to you to do a quick introduction. Hey guys. Yeah, my name is Michael. I'm the developer advocate lead here at Xeno and I'll be uh, hanging out, uh, helping out in the chat as much as possible. And uh, excited for an awesome session. Thanks. You. Thank you all for joining. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, over to you, Chris. Awesome. Hello, everybody. My name is Chris. I'm the head of customer success here at Xano. I'm super excited to be here and uh, get schooled on LLMs from uh, Lachlan and uh, help you all out in the chat as much as I can. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Um, and yes, Lachlan is going to be our host today. Uh, Lachlan, I'll pass it over to you to do your introduction and to get us started. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for showing up on, uh, I guess, from all the different parts around the world where you are. Excited today to kind of do the, the first introduction into, yeah, introduction to LMs. Can you now see my screen? Yes, we can. Get it set up. So um, I guess really uh, it's a pretty common topic at the moment to hear about AI and like, you know, we hear about you know everywhere, but how do you actually use it? So this session is designed to kind of give you an idea around how to evaluate different LLMs and how to start to use them inside your applications and your function stack. So myself, uh, I get this out of the way as well. Uh, so I'm a developer advocate here at Xano, and Michael and I's roles really are to make sure that our customers, our clients, and our product are really aligned. So that means that you know how to do all the you know the required things inside of working with Xano. Today, what we're going to cover really first is just a very basic introduction to LLMs, and then what we're going to do is we're going to actually analyze what are the available LLMs in the market today. What are some of the top performing ones? What are some of the key things that we're actually going to look at um, when we're evaluating which LLM to choose? Once we've reviewed the LLMs that uh, we're going to explore, we can then actually connect with one inside the function stack. I'm going to show you three different levels of how you can kind of take a basic request to an LLM via API. Then how can we improve that to get a better response? Then how can we even get that response into our database? You know, thinking we use text and JSON, how can we kind of do all those conversions to make it easy to work with in the function stack? And the last one's a little bit of theory again, where we're going to basically go through and look at, we have a problem and we need to look at a different ways to optimize our LLM's query. How can we improve that response and get the desired result? So there's kind of a process we can follow or um, well, step-by-step instructions of what to try first um, when you're trying to get those desired results. So I guess um, to really begin, uh, a really starting point, I'm not going to go into deep around how LLMs work because it gets pretty complicated, but I just want to set some ground rules or some definitions that we can all follow. So it makes sense as I start to analyze these different LLMs as to you know, what their different capabilities are. So very basically, large language models are essentially um, large items that are trained on lots of general data. What that means, it's generally public data sets that it's been trained on. So all the internet, and controversially Reddit and other places. But what it doesn't have access to is private knowledge. So your own personal documentation, your private documents, um, your workflows inside of your business, they're generally limited to these public data sets. A really basic process is, you know, you ask it a question and it's going to give you back a response. Now, why LLMs have kind of um, become such a big thing is what they're actually doing is they're not actually seeing text like we do. LLMs actually convert the text that you give it and they convert it into tokens. And what they're then doing is they're looking for patterns inside of those tokens or commonly seen trends within large corpuses of data. And with lots of training and lots of iteration, they're able to find all those patterns that exist in human language. And they're able to then predict what the next word is in a sequence to make it sound as if a human was kind of uh, you know, responding to your question. And why that's kind of unique compared to your previous types of translation AI is where we take, say, English to French. What happened is previously you were comparing one item at a time where if you need to convert dog into um, how you said it in French, I don't speak French, so I don't know the, the translation there. But what it LLMs use is they use an intention mechanism. So it's able to essentially maintain coherence across a large amount of data and create translations on that as opposed to just one word at a time. Now, why I mentioned tokens is when you start to analyze working with APIs and LLMs, all of their cost models operate on tokens. So as mentioned, we don't 
LMs don't see words, they see tokens, and as such, they charge you per token to actually use these LMs. Now, how a tokenizer works is it's not exact science, it's kind of different per model. So one uh, tokenizer and one LM will look at things slightly different to another LM. But what it's actually doing underneath the hood is it's taking that large amount of text you have, and then it's splitting it into these tokens, and it's not an exact match word for word. As you can see, for example, this is an example of how an LLM actually sees a, a sentence. And we can see most, in most cases, it's basically splitting between two individual words. But you can see, um, for example, chatbots. Chatbots is one word, but it's actually splitting that into two tokens. So what that introduces is some challenges around when you have an LLM, you're asking it to produce a certain set of words, for example doesn't actually know what a word is per se, it's looking at tokens. So sometimes you can get some misalignment with, if you want it to produce 100 word responses, it might produce 80 words or it might produce 120 words. So it's a very sort of generalized um, thing you can look at there. Now, if you're looking to do some math on, well, how do I actually translate what these tokens are and what the cost is, a really good rule to follow is one token is roughly four characters, or similar to a word. You can kind of do that math um, to work out your cost of your APIs, but we'll explore that a little bit more in a moment. The other key thing I wanted to explore when working with um, uh, LLMs is they have what you call a context window. And this is basically how big is its focus and how big is the brain of this LLM. And they generally range from somewhere around 4,000 tokens up to a million tokens. So that means in one API request, when you send across data to an LLM, you're limited to approximately eight to 200 Google Doc pages in terms of the context you can give it. And depending which LLM you use will depend on how much information you can kind of jam into it for a single response. Now, something that, that also they have is not just an input limit, but LLM is also limited to the amount of tokens they can output. So if you're wanting it to produce 200,000 documents for you in one API request, it's just simply not possible. And we'll look at kind of the different LLMs and what their various input and output token limits are in a moment. Now, some of the common problems we're going to overcome at the end of this session is when you're working with an LM, really the biggest trick is how can I get the desired output that I want consistently and making sure it's the right information. So some of the problems you experience is quite often you can have what we call hallucinations. So it's basically giving you an incorrect response. It's non cool. It doesn't really understand um, the topic. Sometimes it's unable to, even if you give it a million tokens worth of data, Sometimes it struggles to maintain coherence across the entire context. And sometimes you get really inconsistent responses. One time it might give you an answer of two, and the next time it might give you an answer of three. So we can look at different methods to um, improve the reliability of the responses that we're getting. So um, when evaluating an LLM, it really comes down to your individual needs. And there isn't really a one size fits all approach. Um, trying to just use the same LLM to do the same thing over and over again across various different tasks it's generally going to either cost you a lot or it's not going to perform the way that you want. So when you're beginning to analyze the different LLMs, some of the key points that you're looking at uh, is the cost. How much is it going to cost to run my entire project, but also per API request? How fast is it going to respond? So if this is a real-time chatbot that's taking 50 seconds to process your requests, that's going to be a pretty poor user experience for a real-time chat. So generally smaller models perform faster. Privacy is a pretty big one we hear quite often when it comes to um, clients that have, say, um, HIPAA compliance or have sensitive medical data or things like that where they need to have really strong privacy policies. So how can you, um, when it comes to privacy, you might look at self-hosting one of your models to ensure that the LM you're using actually doesn't leave your environment. But we'll show you some options as to which ones can do that in just a moment. We also then have the capabilities. So you know, we spoke about a context window. How much information can you jam into a, 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 an AI? Modalities, if you need it to be able to respond based on text inputs or image inputs, or even now, Google models now support video inputs as well. So what type of task do you need your AI to do will depend on which one you choose. And the last one really comes down to extensibility. If you have a model that you want to then extend and make it uh, perform in a different way and do that reliably, so certain models also have an option to fine tune as well. We'll explore kind of which options uh, have that available. So um, today we're going to compare some of the, the, the best models in the market. Um, you probably all know OpenAI, you know, Google, you know, Anthropic. Um, but we also have some open source models we're going to compare today as well, which is Grok. Now, Grok isn't actually a model. It's a host that provides uh, open source models. You might have heard of 
um, Facebook or Meta's uh, recent models called Llama 3. Um, Grok enables you to access the, the best open source models from Rollable and a really fast API. Now, one of the other things I didn't consider as well, which should be something to consider, is majority of uh, models are actually trained best on English text. And when you're starting to look at um, outputting your uh, outputs in a different language, certain models do perform better with different languages. DeepSeek, for example, is a really cost-effective open source model, which performs as good as GPT-4 and OpenAI, but with Chinese data. So there's also what language is another option as to what to consider when uh, kind of evaluating your LMs. Okay, so I've now got, we're going to actually dive into looking at a whole bunch of different LMs. And what you can see here is a big long list of kind of all of the top models in the market at the moment. And I've currently now got these ranked based on ELO. Now, when it comes to working out what the best model is, there isn't really good testing mechanisms at the moment to determine what the best model is. And the ELO I'm using here is by a, a public uh, company which benchmarks different LMs. It's called Chatbot Arena. And overall, what the ELO rating is supposed to determine for you is what is the overall general capabilities of these models when performing different types of tasks. So um, GPT-40, is the flagship model by OpenAI. It's currently ranked highest, meaning it's the most generally capable model. But as we'll get to in a moment, there's many different factors to consider in terms of the cost, what the input limit is, and also the modalities that are available, which will help us determine, is it actually the right model to use? So getting back to a moment for, and we'll go from left to right in terms of these different items to look at. The first one is this input limit. So we spoke earlier about the context window, which is how much attention can your LM actually maintain across the data that you give it. And you can see there's quite a variance between our top model, say Gemini, which can load a million tokens into it, which is 200, which is 2000 Google Docs, all the way down to our open source models, such as Llama 3, which can only produce or, or take in 16 documents or Google Docs. So really, um, when it comes to the task at hand, if you have 200,000 documents, then surely you'd want to use Gemini as the model for you, right? Well, that's generally not the case either, because if you're constantly loading 200 or 2,000 documents into your prompts, it's going to become really expensive because you're basically having, you're getting charged based on how much input you give it and how much output you actually get from that particular LM. So we have a lot of different methods to basically only provide the LLM with the required context that's going to help it answer the question. And if you overfill your LLMs with too much of an input, then they have this problem where they it's called missing in the middle. You, you might have some really important instructions somewhere within those million tokens, but it only read the top of it properly and the bottom of it properly, and it missed those important instructions in the middle. So context windows and large input limits are great for certain tasks, but the majority of applications you build will actually only require a much smaller level input limit, and you'll find that these open source models are able to perform the tasks just as well, generally faster and generally more cost effectively as well. So there's really a comparison you need to consider around what type of task are you doing, and generally most tasks are required this much context to load in. Now it's all good that we can load in again 2000 documents to Gemini, but you'll see that we actually have an output limit as well. So I can't ask it to rewrite all 2000 documents in one go. Are actually limited by the amount of, amount of tokens it can output. So somewhere between eight to 16 pages is the maximum output that you can actually get when using one of these large language models. So you need to be conscious with how many times do you actually need to contact an API and what information are you give it each time. If you're asking LM to rewrite all of your data, you're going to need to do it in batches of you know, roughly six to 8,000 tokens as an input and asking it to rewrite it over and over and in pure. Now, I've also got some cost comparisons here because this is going to be a big one when it comes to working with large amounts of data. At a very starting point, if we're looking to process uh, up here, we've got uh, tokens. So if we have a million tokens, both input and output, we can see that just to process a million tokens or roughly uh, 200, 2,000 docs, which is quite a lot, GPT-4 is going to cost you roughly $90 to process these million tokens, both input and output. Whereas our open source models, such as Llama 3, it's going to cost you around 15 cents compared to $90 to process the same amount of data. 
So as you can see, the cost between the, the two is, is there's quite a difference between um, what you can expect with two different models. A different example, tokens are a bit of an arbitrary measure, but we can look at those documents as said. So we're actually beginning to process a thousand documents. A thousand documents is actually the same as processing a million tokens. It's just an easy way to look at it. But what happens if we start to process audio? So say you're starting to um, process this recording and you're, you've got an audio transcript. We're starting to process a thousand hours of audio. All of a sudden, we've now got $3,000 cost for GPT-4 and $6,000 to output a uh, thousand hours worth of context as well. Whereas using an open source model or one of our lower powered models, you can achieve the same task for roughly $15 to $150. So the first thing I really analyze is can I achieve the task with a model that's going to be cost effective? And generally you'll find these smaller models down here as well, actually faster as well. So you're going to get a quicker response from that. Now, um, one other example is video. Uh, so there's a few different models now that can actually support full video. But if we're looking to process a thousand hours of video, so that's going to be screenshots and descriptions of what's happening in each frame of the actual video plus then the audio transcription and other kind of um, basing items that keeps the LLM coherent on the video. When we process a thousand hours of video, all of a sudden we're looking at a wage of somebody for a year to process. So the difference between using GPT-4 and say Claude 3 Haiku is gonna save you $90,000 in overall your AI project. So um, I see a lot of people, why I kind of have on this is a lot of people actually just use GPT-4 for everything. And you know it's an easy solution, it's a great model, but it's extremely expensive and you can get the desired results elsewhere. Across to the right here, we've got kind of some other key points to evaluate as well. And all the models you see here, um, I've only included what I consider some of the best models in the market. So everything you can see here is kind of the top of the tier at the moment. So if you're actually looking to build a production application and a reliable LLM, these are one of the ones that I would choose across these different options. We have um, different models have different modality support. So We'll see when we filter down to only show the different LLMs that have vision support or the ability to process images, we're limited to really the, the large providers such as OpenAI, Google, and Anthropic. And when it comes to processing images, I really prefer to have um, items that are generally cost effective. So I really like the Gemini 1.5 flash models. I really like the Claude uh, Haiku model as well, which are very cost effective models, but also very, very capable. As mentioned, if you're looking to actually process video, Gemini, um, their latest models by Google, can now actually be given a full video and it can analyze it, break it down, summarize it, perform all sorts of tasks and with retrieval across that video, which is super powerful. I think very, very soon that we see more of these multi multimodal LLMs, you're going to see that um, it's going to be across all the different facets of how you develop your applications. Moving into some more of the um, other kind of characteristics of LLMs, this one's quite important um, is open source. And why would we choose an open source model versus a proprietary model? And the core reason generally is one, maybe it's an ethics-based thing, but generally um, open source models allow you to self-host. So all the options I show you here are actually hosted by a company, but if you can actually take these base models yourself, you can self-host them. So the instance that say you have a Xano application on our enterprise plan and you have health care data, we can actually load Docker microservices into our enterprise plans, and you can load an image which contains an LLM and on your BYOC plans and enterprise, you can even connect to GPU or within your own general environment. You can process that sensitive data without having to contact an external third party where there might be a sufficient data processing agreement that actually works with your requirements. So open source models are generally those ones you look to when you really want complete control over the model. And the next kind of control over that model comes into fine tuning. So this is more of a, a, a complex topic when it comes to getting the desired output for your LM. Fine tuning is, as mentioned, that LMs have a large general corpus of data that they're trained on. But we want to know specifically about Xano. We want to know specifically how to produce SQL for Xano users. So in that instance, we can take a base model and we can actually add additional data to the model via uh, processing it with GPUs. And that additional data then kind of narrows down what the specific task is for that AI. And generally you fine tune when you're looking to reduce costs, you're getting lots and lots and lots of queries and you're needing to reduce the costs and, and also then to get it to be better at specific tasks. 
So um, really, when I consider for models at the moment is uh, my favorites really are some of these cheap models. Um, if you're testing out and wanting to play with models, my ones I'd really recommend is have a look at Grok, um, which currently hosts all open source models for free. Um, I really like the Llama 3 8B model and Llama 3 70B models. They perform really, really quickly and are quite cheap and effective. But uh, that's kind of a very introduction to kind of how we'd analyze LMs and some of the core components of what you're going to consider when evaluating if it's the right LM to use. What I'm going to do now is, is less theory and kind of actually get into um, building something in the function stack and showing you the next part of how can we actually connect to working with LMs in the function stack. So um, if you don't know what the function stack is, this is kind of the, 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 the core part of Xana, which allows you to perform all your logic throughout the systems. And we're going to do a really simple exercise where we're trying to create a blog post for Xano, and we want it to be able to answer based on the knowledge of Xano. So we want it to make sure that the information it provides is factual and it's useful for the users. We're going to go on three steps of kind of how we'd look at improving our API requests to uh, basically get the desired output. Now, firstly, whenever you're connecting to an LM, um, all the ones I've mentioned so far today, they're all available via API. So Xano Superpower is connecting to Excel systems and working with JSON and being able to perform complex logic in a no-code way. It's also got a heap of tools that make it faster to connect with AI and LMs and APIs in general. I'm going to show you a quick example now. So this is Empen AI's developer documentation, and this is to contact an LM and get a chat completion back. I can copy this curl, which is an example request, and I'm going to bring this across to my function stack. So inside this block here is an external API request. So we're contacting an external system. What I can do is I can import that curl that I copied from Empen AI, and all of a sudden it's automatically formatted the, the request to my requirements so I can instantly contact this uh, API. We can see here inside of the request, we've got the endpoints, we've got the model, which is GPT-4.0, we've got the messages. So what information are we sending across? And something to note with um, working with LMs via API compared to working with ChatGPT inside the, the web interface that you're probably used to is instead of the LLM storing all the conversation for you, you're actually storing that information, all those messages in your database. So that's why working with something like Xano is super powerful for AI applications as it enables you to store your complete conversation history, any images they generate, but also, which we'll touch on in a moment, it also allows you to store vectors as well, which enables you to perform some more complex um, AI tasks. But now that we've got this set up, um, basically this is ready to go, except we need to basically authenticate the API. Now, what's kind of cool is we've got a few different ways you can kind of create logic in, in Xano. One example here is actually using our new expression engine. So I can take this string here and I can actually, um, in a low code way, I can create a quick uh, update here to basically add on the environment variable, which I stored earlier, which is my open AI API key. So we've now basically just formatted that using our expression language to provide the um, authorization bearer. And then we're going to dynamically insert our open AI API key, which is stored in my settings section as an environment variable for safekeeping. So when I run this now, and basically I should be able to get a response back from chat GPT very, very quickly. And let's see what we get back. That's it. So we processed it and we're now working with LMs inside the function stack. So it's responding, hello, how can I assist you today? So just like we did for that API there, I've already pre-configured one here. And instead of using our expression language, you can see we've also got other ways of working with data inside of Xano as well. So if you're not comfortable using a low code syntax, we've also got our complete no code editor which has a whole range of no-code filters, such as our replace filter, which is taking this string and it's also dynamically replacing this uh, open ABI key with our environment variable that we stored in our settings um, before setting up this call. Now, the difference between this request as well is we now I'm actually changed the model to GPT 3.5 Turbo to make it faster. And also what we're doing is we're changing our prompt. And the prompt is, is really the conversation that we're sending across to ChatGPT. So it says saying, hello, how are you? We're now asking it to basically write a blog post on how to reference variables and in inputs in a Lambda in Xano. And we're asking it to provide a heading, a description, the blog post, then SEO keywords. 
It's everything you kind of need to publish a blog and get it onto your website. So if we run this one here and we get the desired output from it, should give us something and it's going to give its best attempt to tell us how to reference a variable in a Lambda. So we've got our response back and here we go in the content section, we've got our blog post. Now this is great, but you can see here we've got a heading, we can see we've got a description and I presume if you actually read this, we haven't got time for it now, how it's actually mentioning to reference variables in our Lambda is actually incorrect. It's not giving us the right information to actually produce our blog posts and maintain key facts. So that's kind of the first thing you're going to try is you're going to ask your LLM to do a specific task and we're going to test it. This is always an iterative process to work out, am I getting the desired result? Now, based on this, it isn't giving me the correct result. There's two issues here. One, how do I get this heading from this text? And how do I get the keywords? And how do I get this blog post extracted from this and added to my database? And the second step is, how do I actually make it make sense? Because it's giving me false information here. I want to grant it and some truth. So the next phase of kind of uh, improving this response is we're going to take the same API request and we're now going to basically uh, ask it to do it in a different way. So this is really when it comes down to what we call prompt engineering and basically taking that initial set of instructions we give it and giving it some more um, information to give it as a better output. So identical request here where we've got the same kind of structure, but the difference here as well is I've added what we call a model control. So Inside of when you send a request, you can send across the model, but you can also add other request parameters such as the response format and the temperature. Now, the response format's really, really useful in Xano because what we're asking it to do is don't respond in text, instead respond in JSON. And this is really awesome because it then becomes structured data instead of a big text object that we can't pass. Now, in addition to setting our response format this time to be a JSON object, we're also um, updating our prompt to be a little bit more specific. So inside our prompt here, we're, we're using be better best practices. So we're basically asking the same thing, but this time we're given examples. So we want to tell it the, exactly the object structure that we want the LLM to output. So we can then use this in our database. And interestingly, the exact same object structure I've given here exactly matches my database. So all the columns I have in my database table, I've given it the exact type and then also the required format to match my database. So we can then take this response and instantly add it to our blog table. What we're also doing is when you get a response back from an LM, it's gonna come back in text format. So we're actually taking that response from the LM and then we're going to decode that. So we're going to take the text and transform it into JSON. So that way we can actually work with it in the function stack. The last step is once we've got that decoded format, we're going to then actually add that record into our blog table. So if I enable these responses and we now run the function again, you can now say we've got a new response. Now this is the actual, um, this, the response we received from the, the AI, but we've now have this variable we've created here, which is the response decoded. So instead of having a large uh, text string, I now have a nicely structured response, which has a title, has a description, has the blog posts, and also has the keywords in an array format, just like I asked. So the, the value with that then is, is because this is just an object, like we're used to doing inside of, so we can now add log directly to my database. We still have one more problem. So we've now actually been able to work with the data. We've transformed it into a, 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 a format that we can use. But the last step is it's still giving us the wrong information. So how can we actually improve it to make sure we get the desired output with the correct instructions um, for our, 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 our task? So this one's gonna be a bit of a weird way of going about it, but it's to kind of introduce you to the concept of called retrieval augmented generation. And I don't know who came up with that. It might be one of our sales guys, John or, or, or Ryan or something, but basically I think it's a marketing buzzword that uh, is, is overcomplicating what it is. All it is, is we're giving it some more instructions. And this time inside our instructions, we're gonna jam in some relevant context. So we're demystifying a sales talk, it's just giving it instructions. That's all retrieval augmented generation is. And what we're gonna do is, there's kind of three different ways you can get data from your database, right? You have your exact match search, which is if I know the title of a document, it's called Lambda, I can pull that document in. 
If I use fuzzy search, I can do partial matching. So if a, a title begins with Lambda, I can return all um, documents that match that title. But what we just released, as you probably heard of, is vectors, which enables us to do semantic searching. And very quickly, vectors basically take a text string and they convert it to numbers and uh, big, lots of decimal points onto a vector plot. And it enables you to basically compare different text items to find the hidden meaning underneath it. This is actually what we're going to demonstrate here. Where basically, I'm taking a simple request. I'm going to query my database, which has a whole bunch of vectors stored in it. And it's only going to return to me the required documents that match the topic. Now, why would I be doing this? Well, maybe you're building a blog building tool, for example, right? And the first task is to generate um, a blog based on lambdas. But the next task might be introducing real time. And the next task might be um, introducing uh, how to use vectors. So I'm setting up this process to be able to take a particular query or a topic. I'm going to convert it to an embedding. And then I'm going to query my embeddings table to return all the related documents that match that particular topic. So in this particular example, I'm saying, how can I reference variables and inputs in lambdas? And I'm going to query my uh, vector table to find those related do documents. So once we've got the embedding, which is the embedding is an array of decimals, and I'm using a, a 1024 dimension vector from Open AI, which means there's a lot of different um, points to compare against. How we do a vector query is we can use our query or record step from our vector table. And I'm actually doing a custom query here, but I'm going to first start by going to the outputs. Um, I've To compare the similarity between vectors, I'm using a negative inner product search. Now, the reason for that is I've actually got an index on my vector table. And this might be getting a little bit complicated, but just to give you a quick summary, I've got an index on my uh, vector table, which means that it's going to be able to query my vectors very, very quickly. But some of the requirements that we have when using a vector index is we need to be able to sort our responses based in an ascending order. So to find similar documents that uh, match the vector that I've just created, we can use a negative inner product search, and then we can use a ascending sort, which will then use our index and return all the related documents in part of our query. But we also want to only return relevant information. So we're limiting the amount of responses you know, related documents we can bring back, which in this instance is going to be 10 documents. We're also doing one other um, item as well, where inside of your actual custom query, maybe it doesn't have any information on lambdas. So what happens is it, it's going to basically break down and compare each document stored as to how similar it is, but we only want to return documents that are quite similar. So this measure here is going to basically determine uh, if they're not similar at all. It just won't return any documents. So it's going to save us putting in just random context that's not important. Now, something happens is when we run this, um, just to give you an idea of what that's going to look like, I've my simple process here is we've converted the, uh, the, the we've, got, we've got an embedding from OpenAI's embedding engine. We then queried our documents and matching our query terms, we've actually returned all the documents and I've actually stored all the Zano's documentation inside of my vectors. We can see here all the related documents that I've chunked up and what the actual similarity score is here. So we can see negative 0.64, the actual lower the value. So 0.999 is going to be very, very, very similar. But we can see that the different documents we have here, there's a different similarity. Now, what I'm doing is I'm taking all of these related documents and then going to basically put them into a format that the AI can understand because remember, LMs only work with text. They don't really like JSON. They don't want structured data. They want just text. So what I can do is I can take this uh, response I've received from my database. And then basically I'm going to loop over each response we've received. I'm going to create a new text variable called additional context. And each time we loop through one of these uh, documents, it's just basically going to concat the, the documentation information onto it. So when we run it, we then have this big long text string which contains all the relevant context matching the particular blog that we have. And what we're doing then is we're taking this additional context, so all the information that actually tells us about the topic, we're then sandwiching that into our system prompt, which we've now got, again, still the same tasks on where to um, add our, uh, what structure you want, but down at the very, very bottom here, you can see I've also added this extra part that says you'll be provided additional context on the topic. And then I've replaced, I've added this additional context variable using our replace filter into the bottom of this prompt. 
So now we have clear instructions. We have an example of the desired output that we want. We also have related context that's going to give us information about what the answer should actually be. So when I now take this one and I run it, we should in theory get a blog post that's going to be in markdown format now, I'm giving it some more instructions. And it should actually be on topic as to explaining how to actually reference a variable inside a Lambda. I think a little bit longer because we've got more context, but now we run this, we can see all of a sudden it's actually got the correct information. So we've got a, a blog post here that's telling us exactly that we want to use the dollar symbol, then var, and then dot title or whatever the, the pathway is to the variable in our function stack. So our three levels of basically taking a, 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 response, a query and we've basically um, improved it with prompt engineering. So you just basically given it clear instructions to get a desired result. The third, we've now given it then prompt engineering and we've now resorted to retrieval augmented generation to improve the response of our AI. Now that leads me into a little bit more boring theory, um, but hopefully I'll make it somewhat fun as well at the same time where our last part of it is really more just drilling down into that exercise we did there in the function stack. How can we do that or think about generally a process to improve our uh, overall responses from our AI? So what this, get to the right owner. So there's kind of a, a four-step process that you're kind of going to go through when it comes to how do I improve my response from my AI. Now, as you noticed, uh, prompt engineering is really important. You know, and we're going to start here. And you kind of want to work through these in order because the option down here at number four, fine-tuning, becomes quite expensive and it's quite difficult, painful, and long process to actually do. So starting with uh, prompt engineering, this is kind of your first line of defense around how you can actually get the desired output. And you should always start with making sure your prompts are clear, concise, and giving you the information you want. But to kind of break down what that prompt engineering is, as I mentioned, we, we just sent across a conversation to the AI. And because we're working with an API, we can actually send across the entire conversation that we want. This means we can control the system message we send across, which is the kind of core directive of what you want your AI to do. We then have the user response, which is the question that you're asking. Then you have the assistance response, which is giving you the desired output. Now with this, you can actually control this entire conversation. So you can actually make up the responses that the assistant has said and use that as part of your prompt. So you can pretend that the AI has said exactly the output that you want and give it multiple conversations as part of your prompt to overall make sure that when you ask that next question, it's going to consistently give you the desired output. It's like if you've got a big 10 conversation or 15 conversation deep with ChatGPT, you had to ask it 100 questions and you finally got it to do what you want. It's the same sort of process via API where you can have a conversation that will enable you to get the desired result. A few tips um, is use examples. So like when we're looking to get the desired output for our blog, telling exactly what the JSON object structure you want it to output is going to be really useful to then make sure it can do that consistently. This one's pretty straightforward. Um, be as clear as possible. Any contradictory statements that you use can really impact, again, the ability to get the desired result. Third is provide relevant context. And that's kind of the next step where we got to, right, is we didn't have information about how to input, uh, how to reference variables and lambdas in our function stack. Well, we can now um, add the relevant context in to make sure that it has the information it needs to answer. Multi-chain prompting is um, really, it's one of my favorite things to do. Um, reason being is, like I mentioned, we can use GPT-4 to process everything right. We can give it a really complicated topic and ask it to do a single shot um, answer where we just give it all the instructions and say, good luck, give me a full application built with one prompt. But the reality is, is there's a lot more nuance to completing tasks. And you can use a whole range of different um, requests to break down tasks into smaller parts. If that was, for example, to create a blog post series, the first um, AI step might be to just summarize an outline for the overall topic of the content. Then you might eventually use multiple LLMs to finally give you all the information you need to actually produce the blog post. Then at the end, use a big powerful AI like GPT-4 to take all those smaller bits of AI responses and then give you an overall final result that you want. And the last one to do is get to know your AIs. Um, we kind of think of them all as the same thing, but they are trained differently. The way that Anthropic trains their models and the way that Empath AI trains their models is different. So for example, um, how you structure your prompts is going to depend on that model. Uh, Anthropics models, so it's, as is Haiku and Opus, they really like XML. So if you're willing to kind of give the 
model increase coherence across your context, and particularly if you're, you're putting a large context window, then you want to restructure your prompt that the, the models have been trained. The next one is iterate. Like it is a process where it might seem like you're not making much difference at each time you make a change, but iterating over your, your prompts and just refining them over and over again is really the only way and the best way to make sure that it works how you want it to. So that's really our first line of defense is prompt engineering. Uh, make sure we give it the right instructions and we're going to get the better response. The next one is model control. So this is like when we get our, 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 our we wanted to get adjacent output. When we're making a request across to the AI, we've got our Xano and then we're basically posting across to open AI. Inside of that request, we're sending across a lot of information, we're saying which model is it, the messages, but we also got these other controls which I touched on, such as the response format. So your model controls is like the physical controls the model has that enables you to get that desired output. The response format, for example, um, is going to be JSON, but temperature is how creative do you want your AI to be? So say you're building a document retrieval application where you've got a RAG process and when you user asks a query, you want to make sure that it doesn't make up stuff outside of the documentation that you retrieve. We use a temperature of 0 0.1, it means it's going to be very determinate or very not creative in its answer and it's going to basically give you information only based on the context. Whereas your temperature can range up to 2 and 2.0 would be extremely creative. So it's going to be making up all sorts of stuff around the capabilities of Xano. It's not going to closely follow the actual task at hand. So not only prompting, but the actual model controls is going to determine overall what that response is. And really a combination of your model controls and your system prompt is always your first approach to kind of getting that desired result. Now, what happens when we've kind of tried this out, right? And we've done our best efforts at prompt engineering. We've got our model control set where we think appropriate, but the model just doesn't understand the, the overall information. So we have then our retrieval augmented generation. And that's that fancy way of saying, let's just give it some context from our database and make sure that it actually knows what it needs to talk about. So retrieval augmented generation, um, we can look at this in terms of like a chatbot, as I just mentioned. You're speaking to a chatbot, it needs to answer based on the documents you have stored inside your database which is, let's say, Xano Docs. A normal chatbot, how this actually operates is user gets a query and you send that across to your backend. And then we're basically getting the conversation history. So we're taking the entire uh, conversation history from the database, and then we're sending it um, back to a backend and we're basically contacting the LM just with the query that's set by the large language uh, that the user set. But the issue with that is, is if the, the model itself doesn't actually understand Again, the topic hasn't got the required information, then you're going to get these hallucinations or these responses that aren't going to give you the desired result. We then have a retrieval augmented generation chatbot, which is pretty much the same, but you can see here in green, this is the additional step we're adding into the process to basically solve that lack of context issue. So when the user sends a query, we're actually going to generate an embedding via the input AI, and your embeddings are going to be matching um, the same ones that you have stored in your database. You don't want to switch and match and watch di match different embedding models. Generally, what you start with is what you should continue to use, or you're going to get some variances in the similarity between the items. So we're going to um, query our database and get all the related documents first, return those documents plus the conversation history. We're now sending across that request to um, the LM, but without context. So um, whilst it sounds like a complicated topic, it's really just that one extra step where we're getting additional context add into our prompt, and all of a sudden we've now got a RAG-based chatbot. Now the last step is really comes down to, um, it really comes down to general data that it's been trained on. And you have this small subset of data that you want the LM to, to, to basically know as part of its core model. Now this means without having to use any prompt engineering, once we fine tune a model, it's going to perform that specific task generally much better than it would previously. So as mentioned, this might be training a LM to only output SQL um, code each time you make a request. Now, that sounds like a great option, but there's quite a few issues when it comes to fine tuning. The first one is, is it's expensive. So you need to actually um, train the model, which means you need to use GPU computation. You need to process basically a large subset of additional data. That could be a domain specific information. So for Xano, we're going to give it all of Xano's documentation. 
But then the specific task might be a whole set of conversations which show the LLM giving you the desired output. So a user asked, how do I query my user table? And then the response is going to be select from user and going to give you the exact code you need. So you're basically just training the LLM with lots of example conversations and additional data that you want to have the LLM know because it wasn't trained on that initially. Now, the problem with LMs is if you, you go down the fine tuning route, it's a little bit stuck in its ways. Where with RAG, you can dynamically add data into your documentation becomes stale, for example. So like Xano, they release something every month. So it's kind of hard to keep up with all the things that are happening. But if, if that documentation changes from month to month, the only way to then improve the response or get a desired output is to then retrain your fine tune model. So generally, it's um, fine tuning is only done as a, a a bit of a scale issue. So if we needed to get um, if we if we create a document helper and we have um, a million context uh, a million tokens that we need the, the LM to process each time we're making a request, then it's actually going to cost us you know it could be anywhere from three to to thirty dollars per request to actually process a user's query each time. Now. Trying to run a business, you're trying to make money. Uh, that's not viable. If your customer support costs you three to thirty dollars um, per message, um, I think that would be a pretty good deal for your customer success team. So, what we'd want to do is basically, in that instance, if it's so expensive to do it just prompt engineering and use a RAG model, it would then become potentially financially viable to then fine tune a model to ensure that you don't have to give it so much context each time you make a query to that LM. It really becomes that 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 balance around. You know, how flexible do I need my data to be and how determinate do I need the response to be? And generally you approach fine tuning as the last step in your kind of optimization process once you've tried all other efforts or if RAG is becoming too expensive because you need to give it too much context each time to perform the task. So that's uh, my uh, overview so far and I wanted to open it up to some questions um, uh, kind of around what some of the challenges you're, you're, you're struggling with inside of Xano or maybe some questions about how to get started with AI. But um, I might ask uh, Liz or, or Michael to uh, kind of feed me some questions that have come up during the discussion. So you know how you kind of went through um, one of the, the first steps um, and we went through and improved the response? Uh, you kind of reviewed it and we noticed that there was some data that wasn't quite accurate. And then we took the steps to like um, improve that. So I think the question is, how do we get around that? How do we make this process scalable when um, the luxury isn't there to be able to review all those responses? And Avon, correct me if I am wrong in that. I'm not sure if I quite get the, the question, but I guess um, is there some little things to get. Oh, yeah, please, so yeah. Yeah, maybe just to clarify. So, you know, and what I meant was, you know how when you were reviewing the LLM responses, there were some things that you felt, okay, th this wasn't good, let me improve it. And so the question was, if you as a developer are not the, well, like, let's say this is not for an internal use where you can review the responses and improve it, but then it's your product users, so you can't really predict what they are going to be, what queries they are going to be putting in and all. How do you set it up so that regardless of what input the end user is putting in, you are in a scalable way addressing all these potential shortfalls so that you you do not have to manually be reviewing their responses and seeing how you can improve them. Great question. Uh, look, to be honest, it's always a, an iterative process. It's one of the, the challenges with large language models is to, to get that direct um, answer each time and particularly when you have unknown variables, so how is the user actually going to ask the question, um, it becomes really difficult to, to guarantee you get the desired output. There's a few different strategies you can employ to kind of improve that process. The first one is um, really clear instructions around what your model should and shouldn't do. So let's use the example again of a, uh, a RAG retrieval process where we're basically creating a, uh, a document um, query bot. So instead of having to search through the documents, you're using your chat bot to answer questions based on your company's documentation. The first thing you can do is be really clear about making sure that you don't have your LM answer questions outside of its context knowledge. And if we use a really low temperature, um, such as 0 0.1, it's not going to answer topics based on um, the moon. You know, for example, it's going to only focus on topics that actually relate to Xano as per the instructions we give it. The next line of defense to then control um, 
a more of a standardized question from your users is you can also use, uh, like we mentioned, multi-chain prompts. So when the user actually sends you through a query, you can actually have a, a multiple AIs that are operating as part of your process. The first AI could be to simply break down the user query into a, a simpler format that the AI is going to understand or expand on the user's query to match a, a specific kind of um, structure or framework you have. Uh, and that way, you know, you've added a second line of defense then to be able to kind of take queries and make sure it's structured in a way that you're used to for format. But um, overall, it's an iterative process. It's it's kind of to make it scale, you need to practice, you need to iterate, you need to test um, and use edge cases. So if there is conversations, it's really good to actually um, explore those conversations and see, is it getting the desired output? If then it's not giving the correct information in a document retrieval application, it's actually telling you exactly what information you need to add to your docs. So generally, you know, checking that conversation history, um, some implementation mechanisms is they want you to thumbs up, thumbs down, which can be a really good way of telling you whether it was an accurate response or not. But really, it's a process where you, you kind of have to do your best to control the output, um, regardless of what the user says. You need to kind of put controls in place to stop them doing malicious things or asking questions outside of scope. Okay. Hopefully that helped answer the question. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Lachlan. Um, another popular question is, uh, people are wondering if they can get the link to the model comparison table that was shared, uh, the one that uh, it looked like you built on WeWeb. Yeah, so um, with that, uh, this will all become a free template. So everything you have here will actually be able to access. In addition to the template as well, we're, I'm also working on a example of a document tr retrieval bot as well. So I'm um, including the template will be a complete chat bot and included in the chat bot will have access to all of the models we discussed today. And you'll be able to basically um, install a snippet from Xano and also a free template from WeWeb as well. And you'll have a working chat bot that one, can contact all these different models we discussed today. And secondly, we also have data sources. So you can see here, I'm working on a bit of a surprise at the moment, which will take all of our Xano docs and also enable you to add different docs from other sources as well, and then talk to those documents. So one example would be, um, like we discussed on um, how uh, that question earlier is, you know, how do I reference a variable in a Lambda? We asked the base model, we're using Claude Haiku here to answer that question. When we run this, we're going to have the same issue as our blog post where we get the response back and this isn't correct. It's actually a false response. Whereas if I connect to data sources such as Xano, I didn't break it overnight. When we ask it, it's now actually able to respond based on the actual documentation. So we've now got the correct response because we've accessed our data source. We've also got a nice link here to our actual documentation page, which is the uh, information it used to return that response as well. So uh, be patient with that one. It'll be ready very, very soon, but you'll have access to um, both the, um, the, the, the template uh, with all the different models and also the chatbot as well to get started with um, all the different models so you can try them yourself. All these models, all you need is just an API key. So you'll just need to register for Google AI Studio, ChatGPT, insert your API key, and everything will work for you out of the box. It might not be a related question, so skip it if it's out of scope. But if I want to upload a flyer, like a party flyer, and be able to extract data from it, like the image, the date, the address, etc., and then fill them up in my data in my uh, Xeno database, which model would be the most adapted for that? Um, anything but particular total into consideration when doing it? Yeah, there is a few considerations for that for sure. Um, so one of the first things to consider is um, what format is the, the flyer in and is that an accepted format via the, the AI? Now, there's a whole uh, range of... Oh, sorry, Lachlan. Davi just said PDF. PDF. So PDF, um, you, you can upload to the different AIs and I really generally use, um, I actually quite like Claude, is, is probably one of my preferential models at the moment. And if you look at image capabilities, um, I don't know whether you can actually upload a PDF directly to these APIs. Generally, when it comes to processing PDFs, there's actually, um, there's a whole range of different AIs that are out there that are designed specifically for that purpose, for data extraction. Um, so generally, if you have extreme requirements, a specialized PDF extraction model, which you can also access by API, would probably be recommended to make sure you get the exact results because it uses OCR 
as opposed to the, the mechanisms that these large language models use to extract that image or that data. But um, generally, if I, again, I need to confirm which ones can actually upload a PDF, but I'd probably recommend exploring those OCR technologies first for PDFs. And then as a secondary result, looking at potentially um, some of these models as well. But I really like when processing images, uh, Claude Haiku is kind of my favorite because it's really cost uh, cheap to run, but it also has the capabilities of being able to review those images as well. So that's kind of my recommendation um, for exploring to begin with. But um, easiest way would be to see the test with each of them and see, can it support PDFs? I don't think um, OpenAI's vision can, and I, I don't know whether Claude Haikus can either, but um, if they can, you'd send it straight to that AI, see if it works. But if not, you'd have to go to an OCR AI first and kind of extract it and then load that extracted information into your AI. Um, perfect. So it looks like we have another question that that Chris chimed into. Um, so basically it just says, let's say that our vector database does not contain the relevant information to cover a user's query. What, strat what strategy do you like to return well, no matches versus just the closest matches where the closest matches in this example are not relevant. Yeah, so that's kind of a, that's kind of where we get back to this this last process of rag retrieval inside our function stack. And this is kind of a it's a test of your data and how it's kind of, there's a lot of different things that are actually involved in getting your data actually to a spot where it's ready. Um, if I do a brief overview of kind of how I've structured the vector table here, we've got a whole range of documents stored here. You can see all of the Xano docs. Which, and I've also actually got some web docs down the bottom here as well. You can see here I've got 394 records of my documents. But when we're actually converting uh, these documents to vectors, I'm actually doing a process called chunking, um, which I'm basically taking these documents and I'm putting them into smaller chunks, which make it a measurable um, size for each of our different um, items that we're receiving back from our query. The reason for that is a document could have a million text uh, items in it, right? Or it could have 10. And we need to create a unified format to make sure that all of our chunks are similar, which then aids the, the AI with one, us knowing how much information we can give it per request. So we can limit how many responses we give it because we know exactly or very roughly what size each chunk is that we're sending the AI. And we then have the actual chunks inside of our vector database. So this is um, basically all of those documents. We can now see we've actually got 15 uh, 100 chunks versus 300 documents. So they've been split up into smaller parts. And the actual vector, if you're wondering what that looks like, this is a 1024 dimension vector from Empen AI using their large embedding engine. And what's cool with their large embedding engine is you can actually um, reduce the dimension size. And the smaller the dimension size, the more performant it is or easier to process with less resources, but also slightly less accuracy. So you do a trade off with those. Now, when it comes to actually querying this data, we go back to the actual um, function stack for a moment. But basically we've got um, this um, this query here, right, is where we're actually taking the information from our database. And the key here is, is that this important part here of our custom query is how we're actually determining that the documentation that's retrieved is actually valid. Um, if we leave this blank and we don't put some sort of limit on it, I can ask it a, a question about any topic and it's going to return the most related items to that topic, even if they're like a mile away in terms of what they actually mean. So to really first determine, um, am I giving it the right context? This is a trial and error process because it's going to matter on how have you chunked your documents, um, what information exists inside of those, and what type of queries is your user asking? And based on those samples of those user queries, you can begin to, begin to see a, a result what what's the actual um, similarity of these documents? So when I tested this here, um, for example, this this lambda query, what I wanted to do is I wanted to find those documents above well, 0 0.5, and this one you can see is negative 0 0.64. So these are again, um, I'm not going to return anything that's less than that number, or le less similar than that. And this is a trial and error based on your documents. There's no um, set number that you'd use, for example, or you wouldn't necessarily use negative 0 0.5 in your documents. You'd experiment and work out, when am I reliably getting the related information? When am I also not returning information that I also don't want as well? So you experiment with this item based on what you want. Then when it comes to actually making the request to the AI, what we want to do is do two things. We only want it to respond within our context. We want to only respond based on the context given by the AI. The other control we want to add as well is some sort of control around the, the creativity of it. 
So as mentioned, I'd recommend a 0.1 temperature to make sure that, again, it's going to be very, very strict in terms of following your instructions as opposed to being creative and making up stuff. So that's kind of the, the strategy around that. I've got a super quick one on just kind of what that chunky looks like. So um, as said, you have a problem with a document, right, where you might have uh, millions of characters in a single document and you want to basically take that document and, and you want to automatically process all your documents. You might have a million documents of all different sizes and you need to create it into a unified format. So as, like I did it in that example, I'm taking the documents, I split it into smaller, similar size chunks and then basically storing those chunks inside our database. Now, when a user queries a vector, you're going to return similar items. And when we split up a document, the actual process you use to chunk your documents is quite important. So what you might be doing is, um, you know, we have a, a document or an article here talking about Bitcoin, and we've got, you know, some information about Bitcoin here. But the actual inf interesting information that we want to extract from this, this document is its recent price surge has got someone shouting going to the moon. So what happens is we might accidentally chunk these documents in either halfway through a sentence or halfway through an important paragraph. And the key with chunking is we really need to um, make sure we, we're, we're maintaining meaning behind each chunk. So an example of kind of what those vectors look like in sort of vector space is you know, we've chunked all these documents, we've now embedded them, and we've got them all sorted in our vector. When your user queries, so in this instance, tell me what it's doing is by adding that 0.5 to our query, that 0.5 is basically determining how large is this circle or how similar are the items. So as we can see, the user's requesting point here, both chunk one coin, even though it's got the important information that we want. So how do we also get access to this information as well and make sure it returns this related information? And chunking is a whole kind of thing in itself, and I'll have another video on that uh, soon. But basically, you can um, use AI to also help you automate that chunking process as well. The process I've used is basically when we've got a document, we're going to have you know, maybe overall what the document is, but the chunk before it and the chunk after it. So what I actually do is when I chunk my documents, I take all of the chunks and then for each chunk, I actually use an AI to process it and compare the previous chunk, the current chunk and the next chunk. Then what that then does is it returns the current chunk, but I include where it exists in the documentation. I include any key points or context that it may have missed from the grander scheme of things. And I ensure that each chunk actually has information that's going to help ground it into the context of what I'm wanting to answer on. So there's a fair bit involved to make sure you get the right response and it then obviously um, responds based on that data. But that's kind of some strategies you'd look at and kind of the chunking process to take your documents and put them into bite-sized chunks that your, um, your AI can actually retrieve consistently with the right data. There's one question here. If we want, to, if we want the user to query their own data, uh, as in, what is my best performing product? Can we use the same RAG approach to make the LLM query against the user's data, which we stored in the nano database, uh, such as sales data? Totally. So that's that's really interesting when you kind of look at what, what are the different applications for um, RAG retrieval. And I guess RAG retrieval is one option is to use vector searches, right? Where we basically use an embedding database, but we don't need to do that, right? We can also do other search options as well. So you might need to return only documents within um, a certain time frame, or which has a particular keyword that matches Lambda. How you get that data um, is up to you. You don't have to use a semantic search option. That's just one commonly used option that enables you to um, be able to find similar related texts. But when it comes to sales data, what's kind of cool about RAG Retrieval is one application of um, deploying a RAG Retrieval as a chatbot, right? But chatbots only allow you to talk to the documentation or, or talk to the context that you have. The value then that you're really getting from that RAG process is you're saving the user the time it takes to search your documentation to get the response. Now, where it's really interesting is when you start also using RAG Retrieval to generate reports. And if you look at what the value that your RAG process is actually deriving, if you have to manually ask it questions, then it's still a time-based thing that you're needing to perform. 
But ultimately, why are you asking those questions in the first place? Well, you're asking those questions to help you come to a determinate decision. So in the reality of where does the value actually exist for RAG, well, the most common application is in chatbots. I think the highest value output for a RAG application would be to generate reports that summarize things into a system format and provide you the information you need to make a decision. So you've saved the time then of the actual retrieval process, you've analyzed it, and you've basically almost got to a point of making a decision. Um, I think I slightly missed the, <laughs> the, the topic of the question there as well. But when it comes to the sales process of the data, you can actually do that, right? So you ask it my most recent fact that you can communicate with that data. Or two, you could say, well, summarize me a report with my hottest leads, with my um, you know ones that are going cold, ones that are kind of starting to flake, and take all that data. And you could run a weekly process on that, which is a RAG retrieval. And you might do multiple retrievals to get the information you want across many different questions you have in your report. But you're using that RAG data, however you get it, whether it's an exact map search or semantic search, you're returning that data and then you're using the AI to process that and give you information about that data. So certainly applicable in sales processes, whether it's um, you know, analyzing your current things or providing reports to, to key stakeholders. Another question here from, uh, this one's from Eli, when should we use the Xano vector field versus a vector database like Pinecone? Uh, and what are the pros and cons of each? Um, so you always use Xano, you never look at Pinecone, right? Is, is the easy answer, but uh, not, not the case. Uh, really, um, Pinecone is a specialized vector database and really it comes down to your, your needs. Um, you know, why, up until maybe uh, six, six months ago, one of the concerns of using PG Vector, which is what we use behind the scenes with Postgres, is that it wasn't as able to scale as nicely as something like Pinecone or it became quite computationally expensive to actually query large data sets. So traditionally, Pinecone was used when you have um, extremely large data sets and you need to be very performant. So responding um, with that those related documents as fast as possible. But about six months ago, PG Vector released a really uh, powerful index called HNSW indexes or hierarchical nearest law world uh, indexes. And with that upgrade, which is kind of what um, Pinecone uses as well, you're now able to process millions of vectors very, very performantly in Xano with limited kind of, um, I guess, loss between the speed you get from Pinecone versus Xano. I guess one of the big benefits of using Xano versus, uh, I, I guess, something like Pinecone is Postgres is both your business logic and your AI vector logic. So working in the same environment means you've got heaps more controls around how you can actually pull in data that relates to the chunks or related meanings you have. So unfortunately with Pinecone, you need to query data and then somehow find relationships with that inside your data. Whereas inside Xano, when we're performing those uh, queries, uh, that's the superpower of Xano, right? Is you can perform really complex logics from our query or record step. And for this example, right, uh, I am actually filtering not only by how relevant the documents are, but I've created another metadata item or column inside my vector table, which is data sources. So data source ID three belongs to Xano docs and data source ID four belongs to WeWeb docs. So with that, I can easily have a separate tables where uh, inside my database, I have a data source table, I've got a documents table. And within this query, I can not only just return related documents, I can then easily add on all of my data source information. I can add on the model information. I can add on all these different things to my context in one foul swoop through this and add-ons and vectors. It's freaking awesome. It's the only way to put it. <laughs> it's like a super power where you can pull your business data in and use your vector queries in one item. And why that's kind of cool is let's say your vector tables, right? You've got only your vector stored. You're going to be pumping through millions of vectors and you want to keep this table really, really lean and performant. All we need to have is one single relationship to the document ID or the data source, and we can then add on all the documents metadata as well, which can help, again, provide better responses from your AI. So add-ons plus vectors, um, it'd be hard for, to get me out of Xano vectors into Pinecone uh, at the moment, just with me, how easy it is to, to kind of manage those items. There would be a cost consideration potentially when you get into millions and millions of vectors. Um, I haven't uh, sampled the, the two of them uh, against each other, but you know, doing your due diligence, you need to explore what it looks like at scale and only potentially some point at high scale would I think that Pinecone could perform better, but uh, I'd need to perform uh, some more tests on that to make it uh, factual. But I think if you, you know, load up as much resources as you want onto to, to Xano, it'll be able to process as many vectors as you want as well. So 
Really? No reason to use Pinecone in my, my view, but um, that's uh, not the best answer. <laughs> um, we had a question, but I think you actually um, already answered this as part of one of your answers. Just does Xano have functionality to automatically chunk up documents for vector search? It sounded like you actually leverage uh, uh, AI to actually do that for you. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So there isn't an inbuilt process. That's because the chunking strategy, there isn't a one size fits all solution. Um, I wish there was, but it isn't. It, it really depends on what type of data you're working with, what size you need your chunks to be, and what results you get from your AI. So it, uh, I, I kind of would love to have that single process that says yes to it. Um, but what I'll be including as part of that template that I'll provide is the chunking process. So you'll be able to see what I've done and there's better ways of doing it. Um, it, it really, there's many different ways to go about getting that data right. That's you know, first cleaning it, maybe labeling it, and then chunking it in a, in a unique way. That's the art of the difference between a, I guess, a good rag retrieval application and a poor rag retrieval application is how clean's your data, how well have you chunked it, and then how are you querying that in the most intelligent way to return the related context. And that query process might be keyword search. So you're not even actually using vector search. You might use keyword search plus vector search. It, it really, it comes down to how can you best get the right information from your database consistently and provide that to the AI is kind of um, your, 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 your best approach, but it's, there's, there's no one size fits all approach. It really needs to be tested, you know, over and over again, I think to, to really get, um, production quality results. And that's what I've seen from experts and particularly at, a, at sort of applications at scale. There is, um, some common libraries that people use, such as, 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 um, Langchain, for example. Langchain has inbuilt document splitters. Um, it can split documents based on markdown format. So, you know, chunk things at headings. And they give you, again, a very general approach to solving a problem. But it, generally when um, applications reach at large scale, almost all custom, those applications actually have their own custom chunking process that goes outside of the standard options that Langchain offer. So um, again, it's, there is an expertise in this. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an industry in itself. And that's why us personally, we use Inkeep is our, uh, our RAG retrieval provider um, for our chatbot that you see inside the application. They're experts at it, they're fantastic, and that's why we get consistently quality results that only give us information based on Xano context is because that's um, that's what we pay them to do. I think one last question here. Uh, you mentioned it was important to use the same embedding models as the model that will be used to make to request against the data, uh, but with the variety and speed at which we see models evolving, do you see any generic embedding models standing out? Yeah, um, look, to be honest, um, it's it's quite easy to use OpenAI's embedding engine um, is is generally the, you know, what I would recommend is a good starting point. Reason being is they're very, very cost effective to process millions of documents. So for most, most use cases, the actual process of embedding is negligible cost-wise. You can process millions of documents for like a dollar. It's, it's, it's very, very cost effective. Uh, when selecting the model, um, again, different embedding engines perform different tasks uh, quite reliably and uh, or, or in different ways. What you can kind of check out leaderboard is there is open kind of leaderboards that kind of show you what the best performing models are. And some of these are, you know, uh, accessible by API and some of them are just local models that you need to run or set up your own hosting for as well. But basically what you're going to be looking at is overall, what's the quality of the retrieval capacity of those embeddings models and why they matter. Um, so this is currently the, some of the best options available. And you'll see there's a whole bunch of kind of open source models here that you may not want to use. Um, when it comes to ChatGPT models, for example, they have an embeddings engine and they provide three different options. So you've got basically their text ADA model, which performs, uh, which is their previous model. You have text embedding three large, and text embedding three small. And the difference between those is really what's the quality of the retrieval that you're getting from them. So when we look at the, um, the amount of dimensions, so this is one of the parameters that we have available inside of the um, inside of OpenAI's uh, parameters. And these can only work on their, their most recent models, such as text embedding three large and small. And really you want to be, what, what do dimensions give you? So having a larger dimension vector, such as a 3096 just really means is how many different points are we analyzing the similarity between these documents and items? And the more points you have, generally the more precise response you're going to get. But when you're processing 3000 dimension vectors versus 500 dimension vectors, 
the computational you know, resources required to process those are quite different. So coming down to that, it comes down to a balance between how accurate do you need it to be and how sensitive is the data that you need to, to analyze. And generally it's finding a balance between the two. Um, what I really like about this, this parameter is um, it now enables you to determine what you want those dimensions to be. So for example, it generally recommends doing it in, in batches of either 512 tokens to uh, uh, dimensions, sorry, to 1024 to 2024 and then to 3096 dimensions. So you want to try to pick somewhere that's a balance between the quality of the retrieval and then the computational processing. To give you a bit of an idea around kind of the retrieval scores, they do some um, benchmarks that kind of give you an idea of how, how well a model retrieves documents. Text embedding three large at 33,096 dimensions gives you a retrieval score of about 68. Taking that down from a 3096 down to a thousand dimensions gives you a retrieval score of about 64. I think 512 actually gives you, when ticked down to 512, a retrieval score of 64. So there's very limited difference in, in from most applications between, say, a 3000 dimension vector and a thousand dimension vector. But I generally start using um, the most recent models by Open AI, so the Intex Betim 3, either large or small, and then playing with the dimension size. Um, I think around a thousand dimensions is plenty, um, but again, it's going to really depend on your application and the requirements you have for it. Awesome, cool. Well, it looks like um, I think that's all the questions. So, first of all, thank you so much, um, Lofton, for dropping all that knowledge on us. Thank you, everyone, for attending um, and for all your questions. Once again, um, the recording will be available on YouTube and in our community. Um, give us some time to cut it, edit, and put it up there, maybe sometime next week. Um, Lachlan will be releasing that template and also posting that in the community, so keep an eye out for that. And uh, if any other questions come up, once again, we have a community post linked there in the chat. Um, feel free to um, add your questions there, and we'll make sure to uh, get your replies. So thanks, everyone, for attending. I uh, hope you have a good day, evening, morning. Uh, wherever in the world you are. So appreciate you all.